So we are, if you notice on the screen, we are in this series. We began last week with this series entitled Damnable Heresies. We're using as the base text, uh, Second Peter chapter two, verse one, uh, where, uh, of course, uh, he is talking about there were false teachers who will be bringing damnable or the ESV says destructive heresies. Uh, again, welcome everybody who has joined in, but destructive heresies. Uh, and so we are, we've been doing that. I kind of broke down a little bit last time, uh, about this, uh, what, 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 I, what we're hoping to accomplish out of this, uh, out of this series. So, um, we're going to talk about today, the subject of Gnosticism, Gnosticism, not, uh, not agnostic. Agnostic is the idea of there can be no knowledge, no truth known. Okay. That's agnostic. We're talking about Gnosticism, which if you take that concept of agnostic about no truth being known, Gnosticism in its base understanding is that there is some kind of truth out there to be known, but it's how you obtain that truth that becomes the, the heresy. And we will get into that. Now in studying for Gnosticism, <laughs> there's this idea of where to go, where, where to begin with this gigantic bear, okay, of, of Gnosticism, because anybody who has ever studied this, who's ever gone through this study uh, before trying to study the, the idea of Gnosticism, and if you'll notice on the screen, this is part one, and because this subject is so huge, I have broken it down, we'll probably spend at least about two or three, um, uh, maybe even four, but at least two or three uh, lessons on just this one particular heresy because it goes into so much of what we have been, uh, what we're what we're facing even today. All right. So um, and 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 initially, it is also the first. What many New Testament scholars will will consider the first heresy to hit the New Testament world. And we'll talk about that um, as well. So uh, we're talking about the subject of Gnosticism. I'm trying to find, yeah, there it is. Uh, we're, we're talking about the subject of Gnosticism and uh, we're dealing now with, and, and remember again, the working definition of what we're gonna use for the term heresy, heresy. Uh, the term that we're using to describe heresy, again, we're not going after every little thing that we disagree with. The, the idea of heresy is that it is a belief that deviates from sound doctrinal teaching of scripture that is often uh, either intentional, uh, an intentional distortion, or a complete denial of the truth of scripture, okay? So it's some kind of belief that is set itself against um, the sound doctrinal teaching of scripture Either this is done intentionally or unintentionally, but often it is a denial of the truth of Scripture. And this idea of the heresy of Gnosticism falls into this category um, of being intentionally distorting the truth of Scripture and sound teaching in the early church. Again, Gnosticism hit, was, again, the first major uh, heresy to hit the early church following the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, definitely um, uh, in the in the writings of the Gospels uh, and things like that, this is the first heresy um, that, that hit the church, hit the, you know, hit the early church. So when, when dealing with this idea of Gnosticism, when dealing with this idea, here's where I want to go or want to try to go in this study today. I want to deal with the cultural influences of Christianity into Christianity. Then I want to deal with the first Gnostic that we actually see in Scripture, at least according to some early church fathers. Uh, he is deemed a, a, a Gnostic. And then I want to deal with some of the elementary principles of Gnosticism and the influences of to in, that are in today's world. In other words, I want to try to make a practical application of Gnosticism in today's world, okay? All right, so when we go to now the introductory, the cultural influences of Christianity, and when we talk about Christianity, we're talking about New Testament Christianity, um, 
We talk about the fact that we've got to deal with these doctrinal issues and this term Gnosticism, uh, as with many doctrinal issues, uh, is not in the Bible. Like the idea of the Trinity is not in the Bible. The word of the Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, the term Gnosticism isn't in the Bible as well. However, there are definitely the influences of Gnostic thought that are clearly presented and refuted in Scripture. So where does this uh, idea of Gnosticism come from? Well, to understand the origins of Gnosticism, we need to go back all the way to the early uh, elementary teachings concerning Christianity and the world in which the New Testament is formed. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, Christianity did not have its origins in the Church of God. I know it's hard to believe, right? The Church of God is right, hallelujah to the Lamb. But we did not have our origins in, the Christianity did not have its origins in the Church of God, neither did it have its origins in the Pentecostal Holiness Church or the Baptist or the Methodist or any kind of other denomination. Christianity and the world of the New Testament has its origins in three major cultural influences. This is where I would love to test your knowledge to find out if you knew what that was, but I know there's this lag going on and everything like that, so I will give them for you, right? So there are three major influences into Christianity, three things that pour itself. In fact, Pastor was talking about just a little while ago. He kind of hit on some of that just a little while ago, uh, but three major cultural influences that pour itself into what we call the New Testament world, New Testament Christianity. Obviously, one can't help but think of Jesus or the Old Testament without realizing that Christianity has its influence and has been influenced heavily by Judaism, the Hebrew culture or the Jewish culture, what we will refer to as Judaism. I mean, we know that God uh, chose Abraham and made from him the Hebrew people. Uh, it is from the Hebrew culture that we see types and shadows about the Messiah, right? Uh, that they, that there are prophecies that are written that directly speak to the person of Christ. And, and I won't belabor this, this, this issue long because honestly, when we're talking about Gnosticism, Gnosticism, um, it, it depends on who you're talking to, but the majority of scholars will say that Gnosticism did not necessarily have its origin religions in, uh, in Judaism, or to put it this way, in Old Testament Hebrewism, okay? Um, however, when you're talking about the Hebrew culture, you do need to understand that there are two types of Hebrew culture. There's the Hebrew culture that we see in the Old Testament, that we see definitely in the Old Testament. We see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We see that Hebrew culture. But then there is also the Hebrew culture, uh, which is known as Judaism. That's what I have on the screen. And Judaism, the term Judaism, doesn't really appear until after the return of the Jews from exile around 537 B.C., and it continues through the intertestamental period um, between 250 to 150 BC and even on into uh, Jesus's day. The term Judaism is the term that kind of stuck when talking about the Jewish influence into the New Testament world. Now, speaking of the intertestamental period, everybody know what I'm talking about when I say intertestamental period? The, the period between the Testaments. You have the Old Testament, the New Testament, then there was what was called the 400 years of silence. This is what is called the intertestamental period. And it is the Greek culture, uh, which is the second one, the Greek culture that emerges from this period that also influences the New Testament world. And I'll get to that in a moment. Let me go ahead and add the third culture in here, and that is the Roman culture. The Roman culture is the third influence upon Christianity. However, the Romans really did not contribute to much of the Gnostic thought uh, the way that the Greeks did. We will actually deal with the Roman culture. Interestingly enough, we'll deal with the Roman culture when we deal with the issues of means of salvation, the nature of the gospel, and the heresies that emerge from the Roman Catholic Church. 
um, will deal with the Roman culture at that point in time. And that's that's not going to be until very several, many, many studies from, from, from now, okay? Um, but for our current study on Gnosticism, we are going to deal with the Greek influence uh, into the Christian world, okay? Now, with this Greek influence into the Christian world, the Apostle Paul in his writings, John in his writings in the Gospels, and other New Testament writers will deal with this idea of a Greek rationale, a Greek rationale um, called uh, in its very baby form, in its very infancy, if you will, called Gnosticism, okay? Because here's the what the, the Greeks thought. The Greeks sought to make the means of salvation intellectual of the mind, if you will. By the way, if you notice on the screen, I have the intertestamental period, the Greek or Hellenistic culture. That's um, that, that's really what you're dealing with here um, is the Hellenistic culture, okay? So Gnosticism emerges from the Greeks, all right? And they sought to make salvation intellectual. It was all about the mind, the intellect, the discovery of new knowledge. Uh, the Gnostics followed this, um, followed a variety of religious movements that stressed the Greek term is gnosis. I know there's a G there, but the G is silent. Gnosis, if you will. And gnosis is simply the term for knowledge, all right? So they followed a pathway of knowledge. In fact, it's, and it's not just any kind of knowledge, okay? Because knowledge, you guys know me, I'm all about getting some knowledge, okay? But it's the way in which you obtain this knowledge. It's the, it's the kind of knowledge that the Greeks were seeking to uh, receive. And oftentimes it was a mystical, what was so often called a secret knowledge, a secret knowledge a mystical knowledge, a, a knowledge that was gained um, by some kind of transcendent experience. In fact, it's the same kind of secret knowledge, the same kind of Gnosticism that influences the church at Corinth. And I've mentioned this before, right? It was the thirst for secret mystical knowledge that led those in the Corinthian church to be fascinated to the point of abuse with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, this, this, this fascination for mystical spiritual activity within the Corinthian church is not the first occurrence we see in Scripture. All right, so I want you to turn your Bibles, or you can look on the screen. I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at Acts chapter 8, and we're going to look at look at verses 9 through 24. And I'm not going to introduce to you a guy by the name of Simon Magus. Now, in scripture, you will know him as Simon the Sorcerer or Simon the Magician, all right? But um, but the early church fathers will introduce him who had earlier knowledge than what we did uh, and more closer to the time period than what we did, called him Simon Magus, all right? And what the early church fathers will declare is that Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Magician, the guy that you run into in Acts chapter 8, Verses 9 through 24, he was a Gnostic. He's, the, in essence, the first Gnostic, if you will. So let's, let's read uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24, and then, we will, uh, then we'll talk here, okay? All right, so Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24, beginning in verse 9, and it says this. There was a man named Simon, and this, again, this is not Simon Peter. This is Simon the sorcerer, Simon the magician, or what we're calling Simon Magus, all right? Who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. Uh, and if you'll notice here, I've got some words and phrases highlighted here that we'll pick up on in just a moment. And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying that this man is the power of God that is called great. And they all paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. 
But when they believed Philip as he preached, remember Philip has come down to preach the gospel into Samaria. He preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized, both men and women, even Simon himself seemingly believe. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Oh, it's going to get interesting today, guys. Now, when the apostles, now the, now the apostles are hearing about this in Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had, he had, third person of the Trinity, not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And basically that means that they had only been water baptized. Then Peter and John laid hands on the rest of the crowd, them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now watch what happens here. Now when Simon saw the Spirit, uh, that the Spirit was given through the laying on the hands of the apostles' hands. He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said, May your silver perish with you. A rough translation of that would be to hell with you and your money. Uh, that's a rough translation. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You neither have part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if it's possible, to the intent that your heart may be forgiven you. Um, for I see that in you is in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come to pass or may come upon me. All right. That's some pretty heavy stuff. Let's see if we can break it down if you can, if we will. All right, so the reason, again, we are directing our attention toward this passage and toward Simon is because the early church fathers, second century, this is 200 AD and following, okay? Early church fathers um, said uh, that Gnosticism has its roots in first century uh, with Simon the sorcerer or Simon the magician. And please don't misunderstand me here. We're not talking about magician like magic card tricks or things like that. We're not talking about that. We're really talking about something closer to the lines of occultism, demonic activity, things like that. All right. Uh, so we're not talking about those, those, those kind of things. Now, according to the uh, according to the, the 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 church fathers, the early church fathers, Simon practiced magic. He claimed to be divine. He taught that his companion, who was a former prostitute, by the way, you don't find any of this in scripture. Again, this is according to the church fathers, according to church tradition. He claimed that his former, his, his companion, a former prostitute, was a reincarnation of Helen of Troy. Now, now, here's the testimony that we find in Scripture, okay? Is that, yes, we know that he practiced magic. Here's what we also see in Scripture is that the, and this is this, and this has been funny ever since I have started studying this, that he thought himself to be somebody great. He thought himself to be somebody great. And it's funny because of the fact that the term great is the term megas in the Greek, Megas is where we get all kinds of wonderful words uh, like the term megalomaniac. And a megalomaniac is one who, by definition, thinks of themselves as someone great. Dictionary.com helps us a little bit even more with this, uh, with this idea that megalomania is that they are given to strong delusions of thoughts of greatness, doing extravagant things or grand things. In other words, Simon was Simon was a megalomaniac here. He gave himself to strong delusions. I mean, anybody who would, in essence, I mean, this is in essence the same accusation that they would accuse Jesus of, who, how dare you claim to be God? 
You have to be a megalomaniac to claim that you're God, except for the fact that Jesus Christ is God. He is the Son of God. But here, Simon, by the way, if you can see the picture, then the dude all dressed in dark. This is a picture of, uh, you know, of Simon trying to buy the Holy Spirit from, from the Apostle Peter. Uh, we see them laying on the hands here. But the guy highlighted in yellow here, that is Simon, or at least the artist rendition of, of the Simon Magus here. Um, and, and, and so now, and, and all of this will be okay. I mean, we've seen people, right? We, we've seen megalomaniacs. We've seen people who thought too much of themselves. We've seen people who were so stuck on themselves that they thought themselves to be great and maybe to be destined for grand extravagant things, right? Um, and that would be okay. Maybe harmless in itself, but watch this because even the people in Samaria said this man is the power of God that is called the great. Not that he has the power of God, but he is the power of God that is called great. In other words, and you have to think about this, Simon's sorcery must have been quite compelling. I mean, you know, it must have been quite compelling for the people of Samaria to have thought him to be the very power of God or a deity or a demigod, at least, okay? Second century Christian writers suggest that Simon claimed to be the avatar or the incarnation of a male form of deity. Now, when we read this on the surface level, when we read Acts chapter 8 on the surface level, we might get the picture that here's just a man claiming to be a God, and then later on, he, he sees the power of the Holy Spirit that's working through the Apostle Peter, and who comes upon Samaria, and then he attempts to purchase that Holy Spirit. However, if you'll now flow back into our thought of Gnosticism, with Simon's claims of being a demigod, or you might hear the term demiurge, it's the same kind of concept, demigod, uh, uh, not, not the great God, but a lesser God, an emanation, and we'll talk all about that next week, okay? Or maybe the week after. But here he is, he claims to be demigod, his desire for more power than what he perceived to be a mystical transfer. He saw uh, Peter laying his hands on others there in Samaria, and he thought to himself, this is secret knowledge. This is some kind of mystical transference of knowledge by the laying on of hands, folks, that is the root of what we call the heresy of Gnosticism. It's about to get real here in just a moment, okay? Because here Gnosticism, Gnosticism offers away the very elementary principles, and we'll talk a lot about several things uh, about Gnosticism as the weeks are to come, but one of the elementary principles of Gnosticism is that there is some kind of freedom from the material world into a realm of pure spirit. Not only is there a freedom from the material world into a realm of pure spirit, but there is also a freedom from being controlled by the fates who used astral powers or astrology or stars and there's this freedom. Now, the only way you can obtain this freedom, uh, maybe you're familiar with this term, is that the body is just a prison house for the soul. Seems like I might have heard that in a couple of gospel songs. I don't know. But that is a Gnostic thought, is that this body, this old house of flesh, is just a prison house for the soul. With that line of thinking, at least what they would do is go, well, it doesn't really matter what you do in your body then. I can sin in my body because it's going to decay. God's not going to save that. He's going to simply save my soul and my spirit will be released from my soul. That is not what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says that we're going to have a bodily resurrection because Jesus had a bodily resurrection. Anyway, we'll probably get to that at some point in time as well. Because here's the idea within Gnostic thought. 
matter and flesh and body, skin were corrupt and wicked. And, and, and in order to achieve spirituality, you have to break free from that body. I don't know if you can see the picture or not, but this is this is the idea. This is the very modern concept of having an out-of-body experience, of having a trance, if you will. It's also called astral projection. This is the modern equivalent to that, okay? Is that the way you're going to receive this gnosis and this freedom of the spirit is that you are going to have to get some kind of gnosis to get you to, to, to cause your spirit to rise above the material planes, if you will. How do you, how do you do that? How do you, you do that again? They, they dealt with astrology. Listen, folks, astrology, palm reading, tarot card reading, all of that stuff is flows in and out of Gnostic thinking. You better quit messing around with horoscopes. You better quit messing around with palm reading. You better quit messing around. I don't care if it's this cutesy wootsy stuff that you see on Facebook or whatever. You better, it is demonic. It is evil. It flows out of a heresy and Christians do not found their fate or their destiny or their purpose on what's written in the stars. We find our faith and our destiny and our purpose on what is written in this book. Sermon number one. Okay, so that's the idea here that's flowing into the modern world of Gnosticism. And we see this flowing into things that are practiced by New Age groups, astrologists, and even um, that that have believe it or not, this is this has enamored, it has infiltrated the church. And by the way, it sounds exactly what Simon the sorcerer claimed to be. He already claimed that he had some kind of gnosis, that he had some kind of secret knowledge. He claimed to be a deity called the Great. And in the Samaritan mind, <coughs> again, he is some kind of, <coughs> excuse me, and in the Samaritan mind, he's some kind of demigod. And again, we'll deal with that kind of concept in a, in a, in a few uh, lessons later. Yet Simon is attempting to acquire more gnosis. He sees what he thinks is some kind of mystical knowledge, mystical transference of knowledge when Peter lays his hands on the other people, the Samaritans. <clears throat> and again, he desires that knowledge. Let me get a swig of water. He desires that knowledge um, just like people today do. Okay? Because what you're seeing in the world today is you are seeing... The same desire of spiritualists, uh, New Agers, and what I'm calling uh, mystic Christians. And they're out there. Is that I want to, oh gosh, help me hold the ghost. Because, because, because here's what's going to happen. Is that, that, that I want some kind of knowledge that's above and beyond everything else. Does that, does that sound like anything today? All right, let me give you real quickly, let me give you real quickly uh, two more points out of this uh, that are going to be applications of what we're doing here, okay? And what I want to do is give you the implications of Gnosticism into modern culture, at least from where we're talking about right now, all right? And I want to bring two points out. First of all, I want to talk about the devious and deceptive nature of Gnosticism. And then I want to talk about the available gullible listen and I'm not trying to be mean here I, I'm really not it's gonna sound like I'm mean it's gonna sound like I'm uppity it's gonna sound like I'm whatever I, I, I my my burden my my concern is for the body of Christ but there are gullible listeners that are in our churches who might receive this thing called Gnosticism let's deal with the first thing first okay Let's see with the first issue, obviously. Uh, the, the, the devious 
and deceptive nature of Gnosticism. Because here is where uh, we see um, that Simon, in, in, in what he is doing, is devious and deceptive. And he doesn't try to correct anybody. He doesn't try to correct them and, and go, no. Because remember what happened uh, when, 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 when Peter and John healed the man at a gate called Beautiful? They tried to claim that they were some kind of holy people and they were gods. And Peter said, don't look at us. We're not holy. It's Jesus Christ who is holy. Well, Simon Magus does none of this. He is deliberately devious and deceptive, which is the nature of Gnosticism. Now, one of the early church fathers, one of the early church fathers um, that dealt with Gnosticism in its roots and in its fullness, and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, there's so much that's in within this information of the, of the church fathers, I'm trying to break it down in a digestible bite so that, that you can get it, but not only that you can get it, so that my mind can get it. Because after reading a bunch of it, I mean, I'm, I'm, and I've listened to some Bible teachers on Gnosticism, they go into stuff that if I were to go into it, I'd probably lose myself, okay? So I'm trying to break it down here. But the early church father, uh, Irenaeus here, and that may not be the correct pronunciation, but I'm calling him Irenaeus, okay? He wrote a book called Against Heresies. And we'll get into more of that probably within the weeks to come. But he wrote a book, and he starts out talking about Gnosticism, and this is what he says. And 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 you got to understand something too. Arrhenius here is writing between one around one seventy eight A.D. This is shortly after John received his revelation, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, he writes about one hundred A.D. So this is only about seventy eight years. After John receives his, his revelation of Jesus Christ, all right? And here is Irenaeus writing about the heresy of Gnosticism. He says, these men falsify the oracles of God. They prove themselves evil interpreters of the good word of revelation. In other words, the word of God. They also overthrew the faith of many and by drawing them away under the pretense of superior knowledge, they draw people away from God who founded and adorned the universe. Did you catch what he's saying there? They, 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 falsify, the, they falsify the word of God. They are, they are evil interpreters of the word of God. In other words, there are, out, there are people out there with this book who are falsely interpreting this book. This is why I felt in my heart to do this series is because they're out there falsely interpreting this book. They are deliberately lying to you, claiming that you can have some kind of this or that in the, in the day and age and right now. And they are overthrowing the faith of many and they are drawing people away from the gospel. They're drawing people away from Christ. And why? Why are they doing this? All for the pretense of gaining superior secret knowledge. All for the fact or all for the idea that they want more knowledge. They want more of this secret, mystical knowledge. I'm about to rub some folks the wrong way, but you're going to hear me out and hopefully you're going to love me anyway, okay? Just go ahead and let me know in the comment section that you love me and I can move on to the next slide, okay? All right, but watch this, okay? Because I'm about to rub some folks the wrong way. What did Luke say? What did Luke say about Simon Magus in, in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 11? What did he say? Notice the words that Luke describes with Simon Magus. Simon amazed the people of Samaria. He And they all paid attention to him. That Luke doesn't mention that once. He mentions it twice. That Simon amazed the people of Samaria. They all paid attention to him. And then they paid attention to him for a long time. He'd been out there for a long time preaching his nonsense. And they were amazed with his magic. 
some are not going to agree with me here, but this sounds, this Simon sounds very much like a traveling sideshow faith healing evangelist. He sounds like a word of faith preacher. And I've added a few more faces up there if you can see them. He, he sounds like a word of faith. And, and doesn't it sound like the Pentecostal world? Doesn't it sound like the Pentecostal? Let's bring in the guy with the biggest bag of tricks. Let's bring in the one who, who, who professes the biggest bag of tricks, who has the most biggest uh, bag of tricks. We don't want sound doctrine. We don't want biblical preaching. We want the faith healer. We want the one who claims to cast out devils. We want the one who's seen visions of angels. And these days, as I've added a couple more pictures of this guy by the name of David Co da uh, Dana Coverstone and Jeremiah Johnson, we want, we want those who are claiming to be prophetic. We want someone who can speak a word interpret a tongue, give insights as to what is coming to the years ahead, to the years and years to come. Because here's what the sad reality is in the church today, especially with the Pentecostal charismatic movement in the church today. Because what the church in today, what they want is a sanctified tarot card reader. They want a holy astrologer. They want a Bible-believing shaman who can lift their spirits to a higher plane of existence rather than someone who will faithfully expose and expound God's word and teach sound doctrine. I'm waiting. And maybe you've already turned me off. I don't know. But that's basically what we want. And I'm going to say it again. That the church world today, especially with all the mess that is going on outside in our world today, we are wanting some kind of mystic knowledge. We're wanting a sanctified tarot card reader. We're wanting a holy astrologer. We're wanting a Bible-believing shaman who can lift our spirits to a higher plane of existence. And when it comes to the guys who are actually like your pastor, and hopefully Lord willing myself as well, who are actually preaching the word of God and sound doctrine, oh, we, we, we don't have time for that. I'm telling you that the Bible, Paul told Timothy in the last days, people will not endure sound doctrine. They will heap upon themselves teachers who will scratch their ears and give them what they want to hear. And my goodness, if that's not what is happening in the world today, I don't know what is. Is that we have in many Christian circles the philosophy and it's not just in the Pentecostal world. I think it's hit us heavy, but it's not just in the Pentecostal world. But we have this philosophy of thought. The stranger and more mystical it sounds, the better. The stranger and more mystical it sounds, the better. And Irenaeus said that those people who are showing up with their bag of tricks, showing up with their words, showing up with their uh, with, with their prophetic voices. Let me tell you something. When we talk about prophecy, and Pastor quoted it just a little while ago in the last session when he said, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. I guarantee you, you ask Pastor this as well. What, what, did, what, what does it mean by your sons and daughters are prophesying? They're going to preach this book and nothing else. Because everything that we need to know about prophecy is written in this book. You go ask your pastor about what he means by your sons and daughters shall prophesy. They're going to get up and they're going to proclaim this book. 
Anything outside of this book, you are Simon Magus. Anything outside of this book, you are Gnostic thought. You are a heretic and you are not of God. You are going to preach this anyway. I've already lost a bunch of friends already. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Because if and if you thought that was offensive, you might think this is even more offensive, but I love you anyway, and this is the reason why I'm telling you. That with all her- Gnosticism, as with all heresy, is not just about deceptive false teachers, but if you can see the picture, it's about the lambs led to the slaughter. It's about the gullible receivers of modern Gnosticism. It's it's about, and again, today's weak Christians are very much like the people of Samaria in Acts chapter 8. Think about it just for a moment. Think about it just for a moment uh, with, 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 this, um, with this thought, okay? Let's go back into the context here. Remember the events that surround our text in Acts chapter 8. The church up to the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 had not been spreading out. They had not been preaching the gospel to Samaria and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the world. They were internalized, okay? But when Stephen was stoned, Saul, also known as Paul the Apostle, but he was known as Saul of Tarsus then, began persecuting the church. There was heavy persecution greatly. And it was because of this persecution that the church began to spread out as it did. And Acts chapter 8 verse 4 is a beautiful passage because it says that even though they were persecuted and even though they were scattered out, they went about preaching the word of God. Now watch this. Because it is of no coincidence that while the church is being persecuted, I'm not talking about somebody calling your name, calling your names. I'm not talking about somebody's hurting your feelings or you getting fired from a job. People were being put to death. And while they were being persecuted from the outside, they were facing this kind of heresy of Gnosticism from within. Notice the location of the heresy. I just find it just fascinating. And you'll have to forgive me for being nerdy here in the scriptures, all right? But I find it fascinating that Simon the sorcerer was able to conduct his mystical panhandling in the place called Samaria. In the place called, remember Samaria? Remember that woman that was at the well from Samaria that Jesus encounters in John's Gospel chapter 4? I love what John Calvin writes about this. John Calvin writes, Let us realize that such bewitchment by Satan as came upon the Samaritans is the common punishment for faithlessness. All men, it is true, are not misled by the tricks of magicians. For there are not Simons everywhere to deceive people with such impostures. But as I understand it, it's not extraordinary. It's not, uh, Calvin was saying it's not unusual if Satan makes a fool of people in various ways who are trapped in the dark. Because they, when you're not, and this is what Calvin says, when you're not controlled by the light of God, you become liable to become prey of all errors. My goodness, if that's not a mouthful. Well, Calvin makes the observation. I know I got to go. It's, it's almost a few minutes. But Calvin makes the observation that it wasn't unusual for the people like the Samaritans who were faithless and in the dark to be tricked by heretical teaching that Simon Magus brought on. Do you remember the Samaritans? Do you, I mean, I'm, I'm set, set aside from John's Gospel chapter 4 because that's a really telltale issue there too. Do you remember the Samaritans? The Samaritans made up the northern regions of Israel. They were what was left of the northern tribes, the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you remember your Old Testament studies, the great sin of northern kingdom, of the northern kingdom, is found in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 16. It's called the sin of Jeroboam. 
and he made all the northern kingdom. In fact, a pastor's dealing with Elijah right now, and Elijah had to preach against Ahab and Jezebel. And why was Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel in particular, so easily able to introduce Baal worship and almost demand it be a state-sanctioned religion? Do away with the worship of Yahweh. Do away with the worship of the Lord. Why? Because when you go back and read 1 Kings, it says it had been a light thing, an easy thing for Ahab to practice the sin of Jeroboam. Remember the sin of Jeroboam? The, the northern kingdom was not allowed to go into the southern kingdom. So they set up two golden calves and they tried to worship the Lord at the two golden calves. This is called syncretism. This is called mixing religions. This is called demonic. But watch this. Not only did it have an effect then, it apparently has an effect now in Acts chapter 8. Because it is the same syncretistic, mystical, idol worship that Simon Magus latches on to in Acts chapter 8. And he is able to lead people so easily astray into the heresy of Gnosticism. Now, my closing remarks are this, and I'm going to sound like a broken record. Forgive me. If you are not rooted and grounded in this word and sound biblical doctrine, you teaching that is from the word of God, you will be tossed and uh, to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by every wind of heresy. Let me close this, and I, I gave this as an example, and some of you got it yesterday. Um, and I'm not trying to be offensive or anything like that, but but uh, I, I, if you can see the quote, here's the quote: Everything that's coming into your life. You are attracting into your life. And it's attracted to you by virtue of the images you are holding in your mind. It's what you're thinking. Whatever is going on in your mind, you are attracting to you. And some of you picked up on this. Ladies and gentlemen, that is from the book called The Secret. It's a book called Rhonda, uh, by Rhonda Burns called The Secret. And the statement may sound familiar because you've heard it with word of faith, emerging church teachers that go something along those lines. Except for what they do is they dress it up, slap some makeup on it, put some lipstick on it, and they make it churchy and they call it a positive confession of faith or in other words, name it, claim it. Whatever you speak out into existence, it will be, a, it will come to you and it will be attracted to you. That is, yeah, the law of attraction. There it is. Uh, yeah, that is Gnosticism. That is heresy. Nowhere in scripture does the Bible teach that. By the way, fun fact, I found this book that I have it in my library. One day I'll burn it perhaps, but I have it in my library for research right now. But I found this book in the bookstore under the heading of New Age Books. And all Christians are doing and all false teachers are doing are taking some of the very same words that are found in this book and just churching them up. I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. Let me close you with this. That's my third closing. It was easy for the Samaritans to be deceived by Simon Magus because they were not rooted and grounded in the word of God. They had a history of welcoming strange 
new, excitable teachings into their lives. I'm telling you, with the exception of listening to your pastor's teaching and this teaching, you need to turn off Facebook. You need to turn off listening to these quote-unquote heretical prophets. Because if it's not in this book, it is not true. If it's not in this book, it is not uh, from uh, the Bible. It's not, it's, it's not biblical. This is why next week, next week, hopefully, Lord willing, um, and who knows, maybe we'll be joined together at some point in time soon. But this is why next week, if even if we're still here, we're going to discuss the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. The fact that Scripture is enough. And we're going to discuss that against the backdrop of Gnosticism and how that has an effect. God, uh, God bless you guys. I, I, I love you. My heart is for you. Um, I, I just want you to know the truth. For he uh, whom the Son has set free is free indeed, and you shall know the truth, and it shall make you free. So God bless you tonight. Um, we'll see you Sunday.